I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 23rd of September, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. And today we've got a long one. So I am moving fast because I don't want to waste any time here at the beginning. We've got a lot to give to you. This is one where we had a user write in a user. A, I'm used to working in IT. I had a, a viewer of the show wrote to me and had some questions, had some ideas and things they wanted to know about. And the stuff that they were asking is so common, so normal, so everybody seems to run into the same things when they're in the same boat, which is interested in moving to Nicaragua, living abroad, have not had time to come and visit. They're seeing all this great information and wow, it looks fantastic for good reason, because it is. But there's a lot of both misinformation out there online, a tremendous amount of it that we want to protect you guys against. And there are some just natural human reactions that put us in a lot of danger. So we're gonna do a section on what not to do, what to look out for, what to be wary of. And then we're gonna do a really long, this is what you actually do to protect yourself and to get good results and to not put yourself at great risk. So this is a long one. And I had to record this in uh, the night in my office. Um, and it was the, the, the email came in and I felt really compelled to get this message out there. So I recorded it right away, um, all in one shot, really. So it's long, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of material. So buckle up and uh, stick with me as we go through this. Give it a like, take some time to, to show some love on the show. Ask your questions as we go. Just scroll down, ask questions, leave comments, scroll back up, keep watching, um, tell people about the show. Uh, but let's let's just get into this. And if you, or this is not material that you need, you know, watch what you can, but let it run in the background. Please give us the views because it really, really helps. Thank you so much. Let's get right into it after the bump. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to try something a little bit different, and I'm going to try a different format for the show because I suddenly had to run to Costa Rica to do my border run, and because I'm doing that, I did not have the time to do my normal recording that I was expecting during the day, and it's easy to get behind, and I had a viewer who had some questions, quite a few questions that they asked me privately, so I'm not going to post their direct questions here and stuff, um, about coming down to Nicaragua and getting property. And I wanna cover a bunch of little things in this video uh, because many of these things we've covered before, but I feel that it's very difficult to find this information. And there's a lot of things that people need to know and possibly put together. And there's some scenarios that come up on a regular basis for a lot of different people that I think it, maybe not every single thing applies to you, but if you're looking at buying property in Nicaragua, there's a really high chance that a number of these are going to apply to you. And I was all reading the email and I'm like, I have so many things I need to respond about. Let's respond in video because this is stuff that people need to hear. And even if you've heard it before, you need to hear it again, most likely, if in any way you're considering a move to Nicaragua. So first there's the, here's what we plan to do. How many of those things should we not do? And the second part is what should we do, right? Cause it's easy to say, well, what are you doing? Don't do that. But then the question is, well, okay, but what do I actually do instead? What's the alternative? So we need to really cover these bases because a lot of people are interested, especially if you're watching these videos or you're watching uh, Jack Pittman or you're watching, you know, uh, Elton up in, up in the North with his new coffee farm, right? You're watching us and you're saying, wow, these guys, they're really into Nicaragua. There's a lot going on. Maybe maybe I would like Nicaragua too. And a ton of people reach out and talk to me all the time from the channel and, and have this like, wow, I'm really excited about Nicaragua, partially because I'm very energetic about Nicaragua, right? Um, I live here. I love it. Um, I've been here for a long time. I've been in and out for a really long time. And, and, and I'm really passionate about what it's like here. I think that the culture, the people, the food, a lot of the opportunities are really great. And it's a really unique spot if you're like me and really enjoy having something different and not being just part of everybody's just everyday same thing. Nicaragua really appeals if what you're looking for is the same thing that everyone else has always you know, once and, and just more of the same, well, it may not be the place for you. Jack Pittman actually is really great at talking about maybe this isn't the place for you, right? And probably better at it than me, but 
he's right. Uh, for a lot of people who watch my channel, you may come here and really find that Nicaragua vibes with you a lot. And the same for his channel, right? We have a certain uh, uh, general feeling about our attitudes and the things that we like, and the people who watch our show tend to uh, also have those same things, but not always. I definitely get a number of viewers on the show who I'm like, I can't believe they're looking at Nicaragua. And some of them recently came down and they hated it, but it should have been obvious. I'm not sure how they got the impression that they would like it because all of the things that they didn't like were things they should have known really well beforehand and they didn't come with an attitude of looking for it to be good. They were coming with an attitude of trying to find every possible thing that would be wrong to the point where they were making a lot up on top of there were actually things that are negative but they're all things they knew ahead of time and didn't know about themselves or hadn't thought about how it would affect them. So it's good to do those things because for a lot of average people, Nicaragua is a terrible choice, not because it's bad for them, but because they won't like the mixture of things that you get. But for the people who are watching this channel, I bet there's a pretty good chance that you will like it. But that's enough of the background. Let's get into today's topic for real. In this particular case, the person I was speaking to is looking at coming down to Nicaragua. They've never been to Nicaragua before. In fact, they've never been to Central America before. So great choice. Nicaragua's in the middle. It's, in the, it's a great example of what life is like in Central America. And obviously, I chose it over other places in Central America and had lived in other places before and certainly had the option of living just about anywhere in Central America should I so desire. One of the things that makes me a good example of someone who would like Nicaragua is that I have the resources that I was able to live in the United States. I was able to live in Europe and I've lived elsewhere in Central America. Uh, and, and given those things, all of the, the reasonable places, including the most expensive, like Costa Rica, is an option. If I want to move to Costa Rica, I can do so. I'm not under any financial strain making me live in Nicaragua. Of course, like just about anyone, the financial advantages of living in Nicaragua are a bonus for me. I don't have billions of dollars that I can just throw around and say, I could care less where I live as far as financial. I just want to have the most beautiful everything. I'll spend anything to have it. No, I'm not like that. Being frugal definitely better benefits my life. Uh, so Nicaragua is beneficial to me for that reason, but I could absolutely choose Costa Rica and I could afford to live there. I'd have to live more frugally than I do here, but that would be doable. I could live in Panama and be somewhere in the middle. I could live in Guatemala and be almost like Nicaragua. So those things are all options. Uh, but for some people who are looking at Nicaragua, they're looking because they're really tight on their budgets and they think Nicaragua is going to stretch it the farthest. And that's probably true in the region, but it's not true in the greater region. Even within Latin America, you'll probably get a little bit more, not a lot, uh, uh, out of your, your budget if you're living in some place like Colombia or Bolivia. They have a slightly lower cost of living in most cases. Nicaragua tends to be the lowest for housing, but higher for food, for example, definitely higher for appliances. Uh, if you're looking at Colombia, they tend to be really close to the bottom in everything, but not quite the bottom in housing, but overall the mix is probably cheaper than here. Um, so it, depending on what you're looking for and what you need, different ones will be cheaper for you. There's no clear cut, this is the cheapest or the most expensive for anybody. It varies based on your needs. So. In this case, the people who are coming down, they're coming from North America, as many of my audience are, they're English speakers, and they're interested in a place on the beach, which is very common for people looking in Nicaragua. We have a lot of waterfront, so we're a great option for people looking for beachfront. They're interested in surfing, so that rules out San Juan del Sur itself uh, proper, but there's beaches nearby to San Juan del Sur that do have surfing. It's just important to note that San Juan del Sur is the one major beach in the country that doesn't have surfing because it is a bay, whereas everything else is open. Open Pacific almost universally, just a tidbit. Uh, but there's a lot of other beaches that call themselves San Juan del Sur area, and they are in the area, so they would be uh, certainly options um, potentially. Now, uh, they're looking online to try to find a house, and they've already started talking to a real estate agent. They're uh, getting prices, all kinds of stuff. They've already selected the beach they want to be on, and so forth. So, Let's step back and talk about some of these things because nearly all of these decisions are things I would heavily warn against. And it's not about people or anything, it's about process. So if you're living in country A and you're interested in moving to country B, and this could even be between uh, provinces in Canada or states in the United States, if you're looking at moving to a completely different place, one that you've never been to before, 
you probably want to learn something about that place. And I don't mean just by watching my videos, although that's a great start, uh, before you go there. You're going to want to actually go there and look around. When I moved from New York to Dallas, I had never lived in Dallas. I had only driven through once or twice. And so when I went there, I really quickly ran down there and spent some time in the city and said, okay, what areas would I be willing to live in as my first apartment, as a, as a place to kind of launch my investigation into Dallas from? And I found an apartment and rented it more or less from abroad, but I knew the area and I knew what block it was on and stuff. And it was fine. It was a very nice apartment. When I first moved to New Jersey, I got a job offer in New Jersey and I called them and I said, look, I'm not willing to move down until I've come and seen it. I'm jumping in the car right now with my wife. She's never been to Jersey at all. I've only been there for four hours in the area we're talking about. We're going to go spend the weekend. We'll let you know on Monday. They're like, okay, cool. And I ended up taking the job. But we had no idea what we were getting into from a location standpoint other than what, you know, you know, remotely about New Jersey. So going down and figuring out what towns and what traffic's like and where the roads go and what the weather, you know, there's so many things you don't know until you go to a place. So one of the things that amazes me is that, and this happens, I know of no place like it happens like Nicaragua. There's something unique about the combination of who is looking to move to Nicaragua and things they hear about Nicaragua that seems to make this happen. I don't, I'm sure it must happen in Costa Rica, but I've never heard of it. I've certainly never heard of it happening in Panama, never heard of it happening in Mexico. But there is a massive number of people who decide from abroad that Nicaragua is the place they want to be, great, good choice, but how did you decide that if you hadn't come here first, let alone gone to other places? I would highly recommend visiting Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, and making a choice based on viewing the region. Now, I think Nicaragua has a really good chance of coming out on top once you've done that, but I'd be seriously wary of going straight to Nicaragua without having checked what's available nearby. Unless you've done a lot of research and you know that just the, the cost of Costa Rica is too high or the, you know, the, the weather of, of Guatemala is too cold or whatever, right? Or just you're just really interested in safety. That's your top thing. Well, okay, Nicaragua definitely bubbles to the top in that case. Well, okay. But in general, you really want to go investigate a any place, a new city that you're looking at moving to before you move to it, let alone a new country. The amount that there is to go wrong, the amount that there is to not know about a place is staggering. There's no way from watching this show or any other show that you will get a realistic picture of what life in any place is like. That is just a universal rule. There's, there's no way to know. I have lived in eight countries. And if you said, Scott, you got to move tomorrow to Argentina. First of all, I'd be like, cool, no problem. And I'd know that I'd be able to do it. And I know that I would enjoy it. But I could not possibly describe well what day-to-day -day life is going to be like and how it's going to be different and how it's going to feel to me differently than other places that I've lived. I may have some great ideas. Well, the weather's going to be more like this and the city's going to be hectic or big or maybe it's a different part of Argentina. Maybe I'm out in the Pampas and it's really flat land and, and, and just... You know, I don't know what people do for entertainment on a Saturday night. I don't know what the vibe is going to be like. And even if I knew those things, I don't know how to convey it to you. So the degree of not knowing a place, because I, I can't even, you know, I can't really well describe Nicaragua as a feeling to my audience. And I do this every day. And I live here. Like, I know how to me it feels so much differently than say living in Spain or Romania or even Panama. Like my day-to-day -day vision of what life is like is extremely different. The way that you interact with people walking down the sidewalk or the way you interact with someone at a shop or the way it feels to drive to the capital and, and go to the store, or go to a restaurant and the things that we enjoy doing are the things that we need to do when here to make things work. I can tell you some of them on the show, but really putting it all together and having that feeling, you will know more in three days of driving around the country than you will ever get from me explaining it. I will help you know where to go and what to avoid and what things you should definitely check out, but you're never going to uh, get away from the need to come down and see what things are like. So the first, very first thing is legitimately evaluating Nicaragua as a country. Now, one of the reasons that it does stand out, not only is it less expensive and not only is it much safer than everyone else in the region, but it also has the friendliest and most accessible ability for someone from North America or Europe to move here with no preparation. You 
pretty much can just move to Nicaragua. And if you need to coordinate income from abroad, you pretty much can just do so. There's exceptions, but basically it's as easy as any country could possibly be. And that's a really big deal. So that may be what's driving some of these decisions. But outside of that, you really need to know firsthand what it's like before you make any hard decisions. The second point is once you come to Nicaragua, let's say you, you just manage to rule it in as the choice. This is the country you want to be in. Fantastic. Now, this is a pretty big country. We're the same physical size as the state of New York. And that means that we have a lot of space. We have jungle, we have savanna, we have oceanfront, we have cities, we have towns, we have just countryside. And what you're going to like, what you want is going to vary quite a bit. In this particular case, the people who are looking at coming are looking at beachfront and they're looking at surfing. So that rules out the East Coast entirely. It rules out the mountains for sure. It means you're looking at a relatively limited number of beaches, but probably 30 or 40. And it rules out San Juan del Sur proper, but not the area around it. So you're left with an awful lot of potential beaches to evaluate. Now, from those, you have a lot of things you're going to want to know because life in the Rivas beaches down south versus life in the Hino, uh, I'm sorry, in the Chinandega beaches in the far north or the Managua beaches or the Leon beaches or whatever, each one has a completely different flair, a different flavor. The difference from one beach to another can be pretty dramatic, both by departmento and by the individual village. And there's a lot of things you need to evaluate because this is not Miami, where you can simply say, how far am I from the city? The roads are all gonna be the same. The amenities are all gonna be the same. It's just how big is the city? It is not like that at all. The choice from one beach to another can be the difference between having a tiny bit of sand and rocks, the difference between cliffs and just open ocean, having dirt roads that you need a four by four to get anywhere on versus having big, maintained highways that you can drive really easily. It could be the difference between being on the upcoming Pacific Coast Highway sometime in the near future or maybe decades away. It could be that you are hours away from a city with any amenities or just minutes away. You could take a taxi places. Do you have restaurants? Do you have nightlife? Do you have the ability to get things that you need? Can you hire staff? Is it safe? Almost all the beaches are safe, but not 100%. There are some pretty shady ones, none of the ones that they were talking about, but certainly there are ones farther north that get pretty sketchy, and you need to be aware of what they're like. If you were buying from abroad, you may accidentally buy in a pretty bad location without knowing it, or you may get lucky and buy an amazing location also without knowing it, right? There's so much to understand that there's no way to look at pictures or to think about what People are telling you of what life is like in Nicaragua and then find a property and say, okay, I know what my life is going to be like. You have no idea, right? Every time I talk to someone who's been looking at a southern beach house, it always turns out that they're looking at a, at a house or a location that is extremely remote and they would have no access even to a village, let alone a city, without having a 4 by 4 and a major effort to get there. They would end up being hermits effectively because some of those locations are truly beautiful and they're really easy to sell from abroad because it looks great and when you get here, you never thought about the fact that they may not be, there may not be accessible roads, there may not be internet, there may not be water, there may not be power in some of those locations. You need to be really careful because this is a big country and there's a lot of space and locals are not buying in those locations. So they're not looking at supplying the municipality facilities, the municipals, that you would normally expect uh, for locals to have because there's no one living there. It's just expats who are deciding to live like hermits in the woods. And they're like, cool, if that's what you want to do, knock yourself out. But when people get here, they're like, this is not what I was expecting. I wanted to be on a beach with people and be able to go to a restaurant. And I wanted to be able to go to the grocery store. There's no grocery store for an hour. And I have to have a four by four to get out of my driveway. This is nuts. What do I do during the rainy season? I have to be, there's things you have to prepare for because when you're looking from abroad, you could end up with anything. And the same thing could happen if you were coming from Nicaragua and buying in the U.S. or Canada. Imagine what could happen if you were just looking at photos of houses and talking to people who are trying to sell you a property anywhere in the country, right? You could be ended up with one coast or the other, ocean or Great Lakes. You could end up with something in an expensive area or a cheap area, safe or dangerous. Like The options are just wild. You could be so remote or in the middle of the city. There's no way you would ever think of buying remotely without ever having visited the U.S. or Canada. You would, it would never cross your mind 
to think of doing that. Yet somehow, coming to Nicaragua, there is this really strong mindset that we should just look at a website and buy something remotely without having any idea of the country, the layout of the country, the departmentos, the roads, the anything. Like, I can't, as someone who has been a real estate investor, who has lived in many countries, I can't even begin to imagine what people are picturing when this happens. But it's a really, really common uh, path that people take. And it is incredibly dangerous. And it is essentially begging to be defrauded because you have no context, no reference point to know what things should cost. Um, and routinely, when I hear people doing this, they're talking literally 10 times the cost that we're normally talking about for things here in country. Maybe not quite, but eight times, 800% the cost. Uh, and, and maybe there's some amazing houses that they're interested in, and it, that's just what it's going to cost. But the chances of that are very low. It's really easy when you're talking to someone who's never been to the country, and they don't know the regions, to take something that looks kind of nice, really ramp up the pictures, maybe fake some of it, maybe not, Take a really remote location that has no value, that nobody wants, that's completely undesirable, and convince someone that a house worth $50,000 is worth a million dollars because their frame of reference is completely lacking. It's really easy. And how do you not tempt yourself to sell something at an outrageous price if someone's willing to discuss it with you at those prices? If, in, if you're coming from the United States, spending a million dollars on a beach house is nothing. You could just spend a million dollars on a beach house anywhere. It would be a shack. Then you look at Nicaragua and suddenly you're like, oh, this is a really nice house. I could, I could totally live in this house. Only a million dollars. That's great. And then you find out that Nicaraguans are putting up those houses for $100,000, $150,000. And there's many of them available in the country because they're all for sale. Then you're like, oh, I just threw away $750,000. And now I have a house I can never reasonably sell. And I'm stuck with it. It's an albatross. And, and all because you got impatient and decided to buy from abroad. And it's a weird reaction, I think, to look from abroad. I mean, everyone wants to look because you're excited, you're interested, and you're like, I'm going to do some research, but it's not research. And we're going to talk about that next. So Nicaraguans do not put real estate online. It's just not how we work here. The real estate market here is one that is done in person. There's exceptions, of course, but as Nicaraguans and those of us who live here do not shop online, there's no deals online, there's no MLS, there's nothing of the sort. We don't work that way. So when you're looking for something that is expected to be sold to people who know what they're doing, it's always going to be done in person. There's also a massive influx of, of properties on the market. You could buy something absolutely anywhere for file, fire sale prices. So there's no real reason to be pushing hard to sell anything because there's no buyers. So that's the first thing we need to talk about. No matter what you're told, there is no market turning over here in Nicaragua. Houses aren't selling. Everywhere you go in the country, if there's a for sale sign, it is ancient. Things have been on the market for five to 10 years and they've given up, but people may not take them. People may not take down the signs, but they're also not making any effort to sell anything. Inventory is just sitting there. We know, right? I live in the country. I'm a real estate investor in the country. When you go places and talk to people, you can go to beaches, not just like some remote village, of course. You can go to some remote village and they're going to be like, yeah, no one's buying houses. Of course, there's zero tourists. There's very little turnover. But you go to popular beaches and say, what's for sale? And they say, everything. You're the only buyer that's been here in three years. Right. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And they're like, you're like, seriously, they're like, yeah, there's not a house on this beach that isn't for sale. I've literally been told this. Right. They're like, but no one's putting up signs and no one's putting in any in any effort because there's no one to sell to. It doesn't matter what price they put. It doesn't matter where they advertise. It doesn't matter if there's a sign. No one's coming to look at those houses. There's no one to sell it to. And because of that, they kind of give up because any money you put into any effort you put into trying to sell is wasted. And Everyone who is selling houses, if they get to talk to you remotely, right, they have a huge incentive to convince you, well, there's all kinds of houses for sale, but they're all going really fast. To whom? There's no buyers out there. If there was someone buying, the prices would start coming up, but they're not. The prices are still going down. After five years, the market is still collapsing. It's not collapsing as fast as it was, but it's still collapsing. 
the inventory on the market is insane and the number of buyers, well, we're starting to get some people who are mentioning an interest. The total number of people who are actually legitimately trying to buy are few and far between. Very, very few. I talk to, I mean, look at my channel. Right, I have a lot of information about houses. I have a ton of resources about houses. I myself do stuff with houses here. And do you know how many houses I have seen someone buy during the time I've done this channel for three years of watching the market? Just about zero. I have seen one or two businesses sell, sell, but businesses are sometimes able to be sold simply because there are people who need to get, uh, they wanna get residency and they have to have a business to qualify for investment residency. So sometimes businesses are able to be bought and sold simply because they may provide a path to residency that they don't have otherwise. And so that's not really a business investment, it's a residency investment, possibly. And so that may be what they're looking at. So those move when houses don't, but even those move extremely slowly. I have really good businesses that have talked to me about buying them that have been on the market four or five years. And they've actively come out and talked to investors and said, please buy us. We're really interested in selling. And they can't find anyone that will buy them. Hotels that I was looking at, I literally toured uh, and was offered um, prices that people, you know, a quarter million dollars for beachfront property that people then online say is, oh, it's worth $2 million. And you're like, at 250000 we didn't buy it and no one else did either. It's still for sale. Years later, the market is really, really low. The prices are low and the number of buyers is zero, but it's really easy. And I mean, truly easy to put up a website, show pictures of houses that may or may not have been for sale, may or may not exist in Nicaragua, may or may not be real houses and say, oh, these are all for sale. And then when you go look at them, they say, oh, oh they sold, I'm sorry, things are moving really fast. How do you know that those are real houses? It's so easy to create an impression to people who are looking from abroad because no one in Nicaragua is looking. The government doesn't care. There's no official system for, for buying and selling houses outside of simply registering with the city. So there's no information about what's really happening. And that makes it really easy to defraud people who are trying to behave in this market from abroad without coming in person and seeing how things really work, not taking the time to get to know the country. And I understand that there's an excitement to, wow, I really just want to own in this place. I want to get it moving. But you need to step back and say, why? Why am I being so impatient? I haven't been there yet. I don't know the country. I haven't made the investment to be sure that this is where I want to be. And even if you've done a ton of research, you just don't know. And one of the best examples I have is I met uh, a couple in San Juan del Sur a number of years ago, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, yes, four years ago. I met a couple in, in San Juan del Sur when I was here in 2019 with, with Rachel and Alan, and they gave me some really great advice. They said they'd been living in San Juan del Sur for a year, and they every three months just six months, depending on what they could get, they would rent a city in a different neighborhood of San Juan del Sur, not different beaches around it. They already know they wanted to be in San Juan del Sur, real San Juan del Sur, not things that randomly are far away, but call themselves that to sound good for marketing reasons. They actually wanted to be in the, in the city, but the South mountain uh, hill, the, the East mountain hill, the North mountain hill, downtown, all those areas had completely different vibes. They had different time to get to the store. Like travel was very different. Weather was very different between them. Noise, the way that the, the sun set, like big differences that when they were looking to invest, knowing which hill they wanted to be on or if they even wanted to be on a hill was a really big decision. So they took the time to rent four different properties in four unique areas of one village so they could make a good long-term decision on where they wanted to buy in the town. That was brilliant. And that was doing it within one town. Imagine coming to Nicaragua, and if you don't discover that San Juan del Sur is the perfect village for you, for example, you're left with an entire coast, hundreds of miles of very, very different beaches. You may need to spend a bit of time exploring them, both driving around and just seeing what they're like, but also when you find ones that are interesting, maybe you need to rent there or at least spend a weekend at a hotel there and know what the nightlife is like, what shopping at the grocery store is like, what the pulperias are like, what the people are like. Is it a fishing village? Is it there's so many things you need to know because there is no uniformity to life the way that there is in North America that there's just too much to, to, to figure out. Uh, so that discovery process is, is super important. And if you try to do it from abroad, 
you're going to miss some of the most important decision making. So to find out more information, they looked at websites and then they talked to a real estate agent that, of course, was advertising online. So there's a number of guidelines we normally say to people when looking at property in Nicaragua. First is anything that you can find from remote is targeted to take advantage of the fact that you are remote and don't know what you're doing. That's not to condemn you for making that decision. It would logically be the thing to do. If you're looking at moving to the United States, you wouldn't buy your property remotely, but you sure might spend some time on Zillow, for example, and do a bunch of research to learn what property values are in an area. But it's important to understand that Things like Zillow are pulling their data from public records, and things like the MLS are pulling their data from a national database of competitive properties. And while they none of them give you exact data, they give you a lot of good information that you can compare across a broad area. Here in Nicaragua, there is absolutely, and you have to internalize this, there is nothing of the sort in any way whatsoever. And no matter what anyone tells you, not even the government can give you a truly accurate a bit of information as to what things should cost. That is not how it works here. Maybe it should work that way. It would be great if some technology came along and changed that, but for the time being, there is absolutely nothing. And it's way more complex than you could possibly imagine because there's ideas, and we've talked about this on the channel, but I wanna I will go over some of this again. When there's no MLS, none. It's not like there's one, but it doesn't have the information. There's nothing like that. There's no thing like Zillow. There's no public records that you can pull to get uh, prices of how things have sold. There's also almost no turnover. So the idea that you can look at a bunch of prices of things nearby doesn't exist. Things don't buy and sell that often because it's culturally a different place. Houses last longer, families pass them down generation to generation, people live at home much longer, just the amount of buying and selling of houses that happens in total is much less. And it's not because Nicaragua is a lower income country, it is because the culture is different and there is not the need to move around and switch houses very often. So because of that, we have no idea what many areas would cost, even if all the information was dis disclosed. If you went to the middle here, I'm in Leon, if you went to the middle of Leon and chose a block and talked to every single person that was on the block and they were all completely honest and disclosed absolutely everything they could, you may not have any clue what houses would cost what because every house is completely different than the others. You, you know, this one sold for 100000 This one sold for 400000 What's the difference? You may not even be able to figure it out. Time, space, position, airflow, just random, right? There's any number of things. Um, there's, the people who live in them may have not sold or bought a house for generations. And so they may be like, well, it costs $3,000. 200 years ago, what does that mean today? I have no idea, right? And, and has its value changed over time? Have the houses been kept up? Are they actually houses? Are you buying the land or just, there's so many factors and there's no way to compare. It's nothing like the US or Canada. And it's really hard for Americans and Canadians to internalize that there's nothing similar in your buying experience. So bringing any mentality of buying a house from North America is going to put you in really high risk, right? You're just, you just got to really work from a standpoint of nothing. If it, if it feels like this is how you would do it back in North America, stop and say, whoa, they, something's wrong. They would never do anything like you do in North America. So no one has comps. No one can have comps. You know, there are some people who work in real estate enough that they may have some really hint at what buying and selling could maybe, but the difference is could be, well, this could be 20,000 or 80,000. That's kind of the range, right? Big ranges. And then you never know when there's going to be a Hail Mary, which we have a video on that, but that's that's where someone takes a house. For example, let me give you a really concrete example. There is a house for sale, one block off, not one block, the other side of the street. It's two houses off the sand on one of the beaches up north. It is a very popular beach, one of the most desirable in the north part of the country. That house is a three bedroom, it is air conditioned, it is a very small lot, but it is a full house. It is a house that is rented from time to time and it has a, a garage, it has an outdoor eating space. It's a fully usable house, but it's nothing special for sure. Its asking price is $35,000. Stop and let that sink in for a second. $35,000. 
Everyone on the beach knows it's for sale for $35,000, and no one has purchased it, and no one has recommended that it be purchased. My estimate, and I do a lot of real estate in this area, is that it's worth about $28,000. And I think if they got an offer of twenty eight, dollars they would take it. If they didn't, I think they're foolish. But no one has come, to the best of our knowledge, and made an offer of even $28,000. An offer of, say, $15,000 should be turned down for sure. Even twenty, dollars I think, would be crazy for them to take it. It, but by the time you get to about 28, I think they should accept it. And if you need to go a little bit higher, okay, it's in that area where I'd be. Yeah, might be worth it. At $35,000, no one who has any idea what they're doing will even go look at the house. It just doesn't have that much value. Now, what can happen is that person can go take lots of pictures, make a website, put it online. And when you hear how close it is to the sand, you can hear the waves from the front door. When you see how big it is with three bedrooms and air conditioning is already installed, it's right next door to one of the best restaurants in the region. It's right across the street from the public access to the beach. It's one of the best beaches around. There's hotels and really good restaurants everywhere that you can walk to. It has a garage. Um, heck yeah. You could sell that in theory for a half million dollars if you put it online and got lucky. And we call that the Hail Mary. It's where you get someone, you, you take something here that you know is not worth anything like what they're going to say it is. You make an outrageously large number and just hope someone falls for it. And it has happened enough that many people hold out hoping that they're also going to get someone who falls for things like that because there's just so much lack of knowledge of people coming from North America or potentially Europe as to what property should be worth. And so people are spending so many orders of magnitude, more than properties are actually worth on the open market. And then they could easily spend a half million dollars on that property and not realize that for $80,000, they could have had the, the house on the beach that's in front of it, right? The one that's twice the size, has beachfront. They could have been on the sand for pennies on the dollar, and instead they spent a half million dollars on a shack that none of us on the beach will touch. That's, that's, a, that's a real risk. I know of a property on the beach. It's not on the sand. It's across the street. We estimate it's worth between five and $12,000. It's just land, right? There's nothing, nothing on it. They won't sell for less than 300000 it's never been looked at. It's just weeds. No one looks at it. No one calls about it. No one does anything. But they're hoping to get an amount of money that would allow you to buy any business on the beach. Any business you could buy for that amount of money. Nothing's worth that much. It's completely crazy. But they're hoping that someone drives by, calls them, and talks to no one else. And they say, wow, everything's buying. So everyone's selling so quickly. I got to jump on it. 300000 I can come up with that. Okay, you could probably come up with it, and you just lost it just like that. It's worth nothing, right? So that can happen. So when you're when you're looking, it's important to understand that that there's a lot of this going on, and it's easy to fall for that if you're not uh, coming and really getting to know the market. And because there's no MLS, because there's no Zillow, it's really easy for someone to go put up a website and put a bunch of Hail Mary prices on it, and they don't even have to be real houses, and convince someone that this is a general market price and because we're used to tools like Zillow or the MLS providing us comps, a website that may not have legitimate prices or is just prices that people have agreed to all put up by 10 times uh, could look like it's providing you a frame of reference when it is just meant to confuse you. And it can be really effective at that. And you can imagine how easy that would be. I could go to everyone on the beach, or I don't even have to talk to them. I could go take pictures of 20 houses or other properties around the beach that I work on. Um, I could put up a website, I could list all of them, and I could estimate about what they're worth and then just add an extra zero at the end, literally an entire extra zero. I'm not talking about three times the price, five times the price. I'm talking about li literally 10 times the price. And at 10 times the price, I could put up a website and I would get real interested buyers who would contact me and say, ooh, this looks like pretty good compared to this other property. I'm looking at all these different properties and this one seems like a good deal. And the only things they would have to reference against are these other properties that I posted at 10 times their estimated value. It would be really easy to create that long con 
and probably sell one or two of those properties at outrageous prices. Now, of course, anybody who even hinted at doing research, anyone who came down and looked at anything, anyone who called anyone in the know whatsoever, anyone who watched this channel would instantly go, whoa, <laughs> those are crazy. Obviously, that's a scam. And it would be. But it's easy to do. It would take no effort. As someone who makes websites for a living, I could make that in an afternoon and make a business out of that. I would feel awful doing that. I would be a terrible person, but it's really easy to do. And you need to assume if you're seeing anything from abroad, because here we put nothing online. So if you've seen something online, assume it is someone pulling a Hail Mary. It isn't always. I've seen ones that are pretty legit. I feel like the prices sometimes are 10 or 20% higher. They're the exception. The Hail Marys are the rule. But sometimes you see legitimate listings that someone is like, well, I have this property. I want to try putting it online. Or they talk to someone. They're like, hey, why, why not post it somewhere? It's not that there's zero legitimate pricing online, but the effort of putting it online pretty much moves someone into a completely different category. Anything you encounter online or anything you encounter from abroad or anything you encounter in English means they've already assumed that they're looking at foreign buyers who are not doing their research, who are not here, because anyone who is here would look in person in Spanish with local resources because that's, we all know that's how it's done. So they are already filtering out anybody who will know what they're doing. It's just like uh, spam emails. Have you ever received a spam email and you're like, this thing is gibberish, it makes no sense, only a crazy person would think this is a legitimate email. They do that on purpose in many cases because they want to filter out all the people who are critically thinking about the email. Those are not people they're going to be able to scam and it'll waste their time. They want to only have the people who are likely to fall for the scam. They know some still won't, but they want the people who are likely to hand over their bank account numbers, the people who are likely to respond to the email and let people maybe get access to their computer. Same thing with these real estate listings. They want to make them legitimate enough that there's some chance that people will fall for it, but they want it to be the rare person who is filtered out and is so excited, so not thinking critically, so emotionally driven that they make a decision to buy without actually evaluating the prices, without actually checking the location, without actually checking if the person they're working with is a real legal agent or what law governs that process. They don't check any of those things. That's what people want in many cases when they're putting up those websites. That's why they exist. They allow them to gather the data on people who are likely to be good targets for whatever they're trying to sell. Okay, so I think we have a whole bunch of things you need to be wary of. There's one more thing I want to touch on that doesn't fall into the category of what not to do or what to do that deserves a little bit of mention. The same people were asking me just kind of casually, should I look at building or buying? They found some things that looked interesting, but they did feel that the prices were a little bit high that they were seeing online, and they were wondering if they couldn't they buy a lot and build more cheaply than they were seeing? Well, this is a great question. And we answered this two years ago. However, people are often like, well, the factors change. We want to know what it's like now. So let's answer it for today here in late-ish 2023. The market is still very low, lower than it's ever been for buying. That means that pre-built structures of nearly any ilk are at their all-time low or nearly so. That could be a city house in the middle of Leon or Granada or Managua. It could be an apartment in Matagalpa. It could be a beachfront house in Ponaloya. Whatever you're looking at, chances are it is at its best possible deal. Now, any individual person, and this is important, we, we talked about this, there's no like Zillow, there's no comparing prices. So you could find any given property that someone is just asking for any given price. We're talking about the best we can do to uh, evaluate market value. The market value for houses across the board is extremely low. So you get your all-time best real estate investment value in Nicaragua by buying a pre-built structure. It could have been built two years ago. It could have been built a 500 years ago, I was going to say 1,000, that's not possible, 500 years ago, and right now is the best time to buy it if you're getting market price. So that's your value. That's where you should be driven right now to be like, I want to get to Nicaragua and I think I want to buy, right? That should be the big thing driving you. If you're looking to build, sure, come to Nicaragua. We'd love to have people come join us here in paradise, but be aware, 
Right now, it's not as bad as it was during COVID, but the cost of materials is still a little bit high. It's not real high, but it's a little bit high. So if you're going to build, and, and importantly, the cost of labor has remained roughly even. So you're not getting a discount on people working for you at this time. And you're definitely not getting a discount on building materials. They're a little bit pricey. Um, and you're not uh, getting much advantage from a depressed market. You do in the cost of the land, but the cost of land in any house, including here in Nicaragua, is generally a very small number. Here, it's common for an acre of land to cost many hundreds of dollars to a couple thousand dollars. The highest I've ever uh, directly heard of anyone paying for an acre is a little bit less than $10,000, around eight to 9000 for a single acre. That is an extremely special case. It was for a real, which is an extreme special legal situation. It is for a property that took hundreds of years to go onto the market and took many years of negotiating and searching, just trying to get access to. It was a very special case and a very limited amount. Most people who are buying acreage are looking at much smaller numbers, more like one to $3,000 per acre. And that's if it's in a desirable spot. If you're talking about wildlands, obviously it could get pretty cheap. And if you're looking at absolutely premium small lots, if you're looking at something that's far under the size of an acre, you may find gated communities where that's going to get a little bit pricier, but it's not going to get outrageously pricier, except the most extreme circumstances. I realize that when you're looking at, at premium beach lots, that sometimes you get a little bit higher. You may be looking at a, a lot that is, that's $40,000. Beachfront is a little bit different, but be aware that even a lot of beach lots are way cheaper than you think. It is not uncommon for people to buy on the beach for under $20,000, not beach view on the sand. Okay, but... We're not going to evaluate beach prices right this moment. But my point is, is that if you're looking to, to leverage the current situation in Nicaragua, that situation is that housing is depressed as a market, building is not. So if you build a house, you're going to overpay according to market value slightly by the, by the trends over time. You're going to overpay just a little bit. That shouldn't dissuade you from building, but you should be aware that you are not getting a deal. The cost of the slightly lower cost of land will not offset the slightly higher cost of building materials in all but the rarest of circumstances. Uh, where it does, it's pretty much break even. But buying a pre-existing house, you might get that house for less than half its normal value. You may get it for less than a tenth of its normal value. That would be crazy and extreme, but it happens. But getting a house at half traditional value is easy these days. Uh, that beach house that I'm telling you about, that was 35000 that they're asking. Five years ago, easily that house would have been seventy dollars or $80,000. Today, we're expecting it to go for a third of its uh, original value. We assume no one really knows what those things are, but huge drop. And, and that's an opportunity because likely that will come back. If you build, there's very little chance that the market is going to come back to a point where you're going to benefit from having built. You will always have some loss of revenue. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because building versus buying often has a lot to do with you finding your dream house. If you're coming down here as a real estate investor, if you're young and you need your house to make you money over time uh, for whatever reason, then you need to be really careful about how you're investing. But if you're looking at a property that is your dream home and you could care you're never going to sell it in your lifetime. You're not going to you know, sell it in your kid's lifetime. All you care about is that it is the house you love and you're going to spend whatever it takes to get that house. That's fine. Be aware that's what you're doing. Be aware you're not going to make your money back ever. Do what makes you happy. Just make sure you're making logical decisions and not suddenly pulling the trigger on something emotionally and then realizing later that you've burned your life savings and your nest egg is gone accidentally. That's, that's really the important thing. But if the question is one of value, buying is going to get you so much more than building. But building always gives you that advantage of customization. All that said, I have bought houses not built while I'm here. I am currently in the process of preparing to start building. We have work underway to build. So I am not taking my own advice in all circumstances. I am building my long-term dream house. That is true. It is a place I never intend to sell. I plan to uh, die in that house, hopefully not anytime soon. Um, and I plan to turn it over to my children and I hope they keep it in the family, that it's something that they can pass on for a very long time as well. So 
that is something that I understand why you may want to do that. And there are reasons that I think make sense for that. But I also put years into that decision. That was not a, a momentary thing. It is something that we have thought long and hard about and are doing very carefully. And we already own other properties that were pre-built. We already took advantage in many cases of the pre-built building. So we are looking at both sides of that and evaluating it. You should look at it with the same keen eye. Wow, we covered a lot of bases of like what not to do and what to be afraid of and what to worry about and wow. So what do you do? What is the real process to, to moving to Nicaragua to live, not to, not to just visit, not to be a tourist, not to check it out, but to, if you've made the decision or you think you're ready to make the decision to move to Nicaragua and you think you want to buy, which makes a lot of sense, then what do we do? What would I recommend as the general process? Tweak as necessary. This is not a one size fits all, but there's a general process that works and makes sense. And for some reason, most people, it doesn't occur to them or they don't feel like it should apply to them when normally it should. And I highly recommend that as much as you think this doesn't apply to you, really take some time and say, does it really not apply to me? Because it probably does. So what is the first step? First step is you've got to come to Nicaragua or maybe even a step zero. Do your research online. Watch my channel. Watch some others. Jack Pittman is a great example. Elton's uh, um, Ement, uh, uh, Immense Coffee Movement. Uh, great ones, right? Get a feel. Some people who are excited about Nicaragua, people who are not selling anything. Technically, I do sell um, relocation services. So take that stuff that benefits me with a grain of salt. But definitely if I'm telling you not to move to Nicaragua, uh, take that seriously. Um, but in general, like it's a, it's a tiny thing. I have other businesses. I do not make my money uh, from relocation services, but I would love to. I love giving people really what I want to do as a job is make videos like these, mostly the ones where I'm outside and showing the country, the ones where I'm traveling around. But sometimes I just need to tell you guys things. And because of the Costa Rica trip, like I've got to do this at night. Um, and, and I really want to do private tours. Those are the things that I just I just love doing. Right. And I can combine them, do private tours and take videos. That's what I want to do. My real job during the day is I'm a technologist and a business consultant, so a lot of that plays into the advice that I give, uh, but that's where I'm making my money. So just full disclosure, but I do sell private tours. Should you be interested or need consulting services, definitely hit us up, info at relocatenicaragua.com. I'd be remiss if I did not mention it. Okay, so for that step zero, do some research. Do I like the lifestyle that I'm hearing? Do I like the weather that I can look up? Do I like the um, access through the airport? Is that gonna be a major problem that it doesn't have a direct connection to wherever you wanna go, right? Those kinds of things. The things you can check from abroad, go check them. But don't worry about the propaganda that you're gonna get from a lot of other governments. A lot of governments are pressured very heavily to discourage people from going anywhere in paradise, right? Because they lose a lot of revenue to people coming to these places. So they tend to be kind of advising against things they know are actually better than where they are. It's just the harsh reality. Your government is probably not looking out for your best interests. They're not gonna completely throw you to the wolves normally, but they are willing to discourage a lot of good decision making if it isn't in their general interest. They have very little reason not to. So be aware, your government is probably not your friend. That is a very rare thing. If you're coming from North America, I think you know that they're not your friend. Um, so it's not like down here where people actually, you know, the government's actually trying to do good things for the for its people. Um, they may fail, but they're trying, you know, in North America, it's like they actively hate their citizens in most cases. Like if they would, if they could just shovel everyone into a furnace, they, for some reason they would. Um, that's, it's the most horrific way that they treat people. They can't actually do that. They can't get away with it. So the America came up with its healthcare system, which is roughly the same thing. The, um, <laughs> it's true, right? Like you can't, you can't deny it. So as a first step, come to Nicaragua and do some touring. Do not start at some fringe location that's out very far away from the rest of Nicaragua, like San Juan del Sur. That is a terrible place to begin your Nicaragua journey. Not that you don't want to include it, certainly, but I, a lot of people start there and it is very much not Nicaragua proper. It is a very different experience and it is best to experience it once you already have a fair idea of what Nicaragua is like in general. So I recommend starting more broadly in someplace like Granada, which is still a tourist center and has a lot of resources for you. But when you start in someplace like San Juan del Sur, you're starting on the very, very edge of everything, right? Physically and 
societally. Uh, if you were to do the same thing in the United States, it would be a lot like starting out in Key West and saying, oh, I'm interested in the United States. Wow, Key West is like this, and then discovering it's just nothing like the rest of the US. That doesn't make it a bad option, but it makes it a very unlikely option. And you really want to have a good feeling for the United States before you go to Key West rather than the other way around, at least for most people. So I recommend not starting there because I think uh, people tend to be very drawn into this very inclusive culture of San Juan del Sur and tend to, um, because they don't have context, San Juan del Sur tends to take advantage of the fact that people lack a Nicaraguan context and you tend to be very misled. You get a lot of confusing ideas and that's easy if you start there. But if you start somewhere else, Granada, Leon, Managua, and then you go after you spend a few weeks there, you have an idea of what things cost, you have an idea of how the country works, you have an idea of how far away things are. And then you go to San Juan del Sur those things have much less power. You start to say, well, yeah, I know that house is not costing that much. Ha ha ha. I know how long it takes to get to a supermarket. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know what the airport's like. I know how things work. I know how the rest of the country is. You're not going to fool me that easily, right? So that's, I think, a really important thing to do. Starting in San Juan del Sur is essentially setting yourself up and not necessarily that some person is going to take advantage of you there. The ecosystem is going to lure you in in such a way that you're going to have almost certainly a skewed vision of the Nicaraguan experience. And trust me, there is a huge percentage of people who, after they spend time in Nicaragua, they evaluate a whole bunch of things, are going to then pick San Juan del Sur. It's a wonderful place. It has lots to offer. It has some of the, the best food and entertainment density in the country. If you're looking for a spot where you don't want a big city, but you want a lot of things to do in a small area, San Juan del Sur is honestly very hard to beat. You're going to be competing with the, the city centers at Leon and Matagalpa for the number of things that there are to do. There aren't as many, but there's close to it. And the ease of just walking around in a very small area. Yes, you're going to pay a premium, but if you're good about, you know, paying attention to the prices, you can still get deals for sure. Especially now in San Juan del Sur, you can pick up things for a song. You could easily end up living down there very, very cheaply if you know what real prices are, real processes are. So don't rule it out, but you're going to get your best San Juan del Sur experience if you don't start there and you go there with more knowledge. You need to be more educated before going to San Juan del Sur than you need to be going to other areas, especially because other areas like Granada or Leon, they're not gonna have this culture of trying to sell you something Yes, there's always someone who's willing to sell you something. Of course, if you go there and ask around and say, I, I, would I want to buy a house here? Someone's going to take you around and show you some houses. Absolutely. But you're not going to get simply pushed into that just by being there. You're just a tourist. You're just visiting. You can go see things and be very casual. When you go to San Juan del Sur, it's going to be constant, even if it's just billboards or mat, you know, uh, placemats at a restaurant or whatever. Everything in San Juan del Sur is there to sell you on the San Juan del Sur experience. It's there to sell foreigners on the invest in, buy in San Juan del Sur culture. And uh, you really don't want to go straight into that if you can help it. So that's step one, come to Nicaragua and, and make some decisions and move around, right? If possible, you're gonna come down as a tourist and spend a couple weeks, a little bit more, better, right? Then plan to come down and spend a lot of time, right? And, and you can do a little bit of, of manipulating this as it makes sense for you, but you need to make that big decision about Nicaragua and maybe big regions, and then you need to make some really finite decisions. And generally those finite decisions take some time, right? You may say, well, San Juan del Sur is so unique, you may be able to decide that quite quickly, right? You may say, yes, San Juan del Sur or the rest of Nicaragua. But if you say the rest of Nicaragua, you have a lot still to pick from. You're going to need to take some time to move around. Now, you may know you want to be on a beach. You may know you want to be in mountains. You may know you want fields or forest or whatever, and that's going to help you narrow things down. But still, Nicaragua has a lot to offer, and you want to investigate a bit before you uh, really put yourself in a position of being fully invested in a place without knowing how that place fits into the bigger picture. So, Generally, we recommend coming down and doing a little bit of a tour. And this is where a private tour with someone like me can be really beneficial. We can drive around and see things. You can ask questions, go places and get an explanation and, and really get to know a place a lot faster. Um, but if you don't have someone like me, certainly come down, drive yourself around or, or just get hotels and take taxis or buses or whatever. 
but see some of the country, um, both on foot, going to restaurants, going to stores, and also out of the window of the bus and just see how the countryside changes and what the views are like and how close things are to each other. It's going to answer a lot of your questions very quickly, questions you may not know that you had. It builds a picture of the country in your mind, and with that, you will have be much better armed for your next decisions. Then we recommend you come down. Once you've narrowed it down enough to be useful, come down and, and rent, right? That's super important. You need to rent is uh, let's just say you're, you decided on Granada. Granada is the city for you. You want some number of expats, but you also want the Nicaraguan experience. You want to be kind of close to the capital. You want the colonial architecture. You don't want a ton of traffic, but you do want enough stuff that you don't need to travel other places to get your resources. Great, Granada might be a great choice for you. Rent in Granada. Renting here is ridiculously cheap. It is so cheap to rent and you can stay for six months or a year you're not making a huge financial commitment but put in that time and if while renting don't rush out and buy take your time while renting and really shop around spend your time and get to know the little tiny neighborhoods around where you think you want to be look at what the houses are like maybe rent a house for a weekend if you can like bop around in a little area and, and get a feeling for what it's like there. Here in Leon, we spent some time living on the outskirts of the city and then we moved to the downtown area and then we moved to the suburbs. We've And we have friends who live in different areas. We've spent time in different area. We really know the neighborhoods. And if you watch my channel, you know I walk around a lot too. Put in that time and really get to know Granada in, in this particular case. While you're doing that, take your year get to know people, get to know locations, start looking at houses, put together a picture of what a real price might be. Once you've looked at 10 or 15 houses, you're gonna have an idea that people are consistently asking, depending on what you're looking for, maybe 100,000, maybe 150,000. And you're gonna know when someone says, wow, this is gonna be 900,000, you just go, <laughs> sorry, and walk away, because that's not reasonable, right? And when someone is offering you 75,000, well, maybe something's wrong, but if not, I need to jump on this, right? Great. You're going to know those things really, really relatively quickly and with a lot of assurity, right? You're going to know which neighborhoods are good. You're going to know which houses are interesting. You're going to know what amenities make sense. And there's just a lot of discovery to do, but you can do that. So as that process progresses, what you generally want to do, it depends. If you're looking at an enclave, you may have no choice. Just go talk to people. The price is the price. That happens. But for most things in Nicaragua, if you're looking for real Nicaraguan living, you want to have Nicaraguans doing all of your negotiating. For us, it was easy because we had staff here for many years, people that we trusted, people that worked for us, uh, people who had the time to go do it and the expertise because they've bought and sold property here and even had their own construction company. So they're able to give us a lot of uh, estimates and evaluations on things that we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. That worked out fantastically. And we think we were protected quite a bit because of that. But having been here for a number of years and long before we were here for years, just being here for our first year, we had friends here. We got to know the area, friends in the area. And so now it's really easy if we were to go out and look at a piece of property, we can do so with having local friends who go out and look at the property first for us or look at it separately from us. And they're able to go out and get real pricing like they would tell a Nicaraguan. And they are able to negotiate as a Nicaraguan and get us deals on property that are not special deals, but we're not getting ripped off because someone sees us as North Americans and that they're, in many cases, they'd simply be unwilling to sell for less than double what they would be willing to sell to a local. Once a local's looking to buy, they know they can't give them a ridiculous price. They have to give them something reasonable. With us, they don't know that and they never want to give in because if they do, they could be losing a lot of revenue. So that, that little piece goes a really long way. Since we live here, we also have some more formal resources. Most importantly, we have a lawyer that we trust. Having a lawyer, actually multiple lawyers that we trust is a really big deal because in many cases, they can find you the resources to go look for a house and they can also negotiate for the house particular, uh, uh, in, in some cases. And they will definitely be who handles the selling or the buying of a property for you. That's critical, no matter what, you want to do, no matter how you want the buying experience to be, no matter who you have do it, even if you decide that you're going to take none of my advice and you're going to uh, use an agent and you're going to expose all of your financial resources and you're going to pay someone based on the more they screw you over, the more you'll pay them, literally how a normal agreement works. At the end of the day, when you actually go to buy that house, you still need to stop 
and let the lawyer handle the final contract. That is absolutely critical, and that's true in the United States too. Right? Even in the US, even in Canada, I believe in Canada, but definitely in the United States, with a really formal, very legally controlled agent-based system. And trust me, my best friend is a real estate agent in the United States. My wife is a real estate agent in the United States. I have a decent amount of experience with the United States real estate and having been someone who has bought and sold real estate in multiple states over many years in the United States and here in Nicaragua, uh, my experience on it is, is better than most, right? I'm certainly not an, an expert, but pretty well experienced. And in you, you absolutely in the United States would never let your agent handle the contracts, not the final details. There's a lot of things they will handle in the U.S. where they're they're tasked with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the critical pieces are always handled by a lawyer. And here is exactly the same, except you don't need all those other pieces. It's much simpler. Just have a lawyer do it. It will save you so much money, so much astronomic money. And more importantly, it will reduce your risk by such unbelievable amounts. Don't put someone in a position potentially taking advantage of you. The lawyer has laws governing what they're able to do. No one else does. Make sure the only people are people you really trust, you know, close friends, employees, whatever, or your lawyer. And make sure it's a lawyer that you trust, that you have experience with, that you know they're, they're going to work on your behalf. That is how you actually finalize a deal. That is how you do the final paperwork. That's how you ensure that your, your topology has been done. That's how you ensure that your, uh, your deed is free and clear. There's so many horror stories that people talk about. Oh, you got to be careful buying real estate and blah, blah, blah. But all of them end with, <laughs> because you didn't have a lawyer. Well, of course, if you did the same thing in any country and did it with, you know, I, I didn't think critically, I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't pay any expert, I just let someone sell me a piece of paper and, and you know, write whatever they wanted on it, yeah, you're going to get taken advantage of. It's just too much money for people to turn down. All the horror stories you hear here are always because someone went to an agent or someone pretending to be an agent or whatever that means, going to someone who's selling them a house and pretending to represent them and not bringing in a lawyer to oversee the process or the lawyer didn't do their, their legal job and they didn't check the deeds, they didn't check the, the basic things that are required, right? Property uh, ownership here is very strict. It is very sensible. It is very strong. You got to do your due diligence. You have to make sure that the person selling you the house actually owns the house. Every time we buy or sell a property, we make sure that the taxes are not owed. We make sure that the deed is clear. We make sure that they're actually transferring us the ownership of the property. All those things, we make sure that's what the lawyer is for. And, and there's processes for this. When you do this properly, in a sensible way, you have extreme protections here. I'm not saying that nothing will ever go wrong. Things can go wrong. But the fear, the, the FUD that people provide of things that can go wrong in countries. If you think about all the warnings I said at the beginning, this wild ride of I'm going to not do my due diligence, I'm going to look without any context, I'm going to allow for this entire framework of, of confusing me, I'm going to you know, put a, a person I don't know who has absolutely no legal requirement to represent me or to do a good job in a position of absolutely knowing all my finances and being able to uh, do anything they want to make money on a deal. And I'm going to offer them more money based on the more they screw me over, right? A normal agent contract is I will only pay you if you talk me into to making a purchase. And the more you get the price jacked up, the more I'll reward you for taking money out of my wallet. You literally, under normal circumstances, and I know Americans and Canadians are very confused by this because they never think critically about how crazy the real estate monopoly is in the United States and Canada. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But you literally, under normal circumstances worldwide, you go to an agent and they say, I'll take you know X percentage of the sale. That means they have to get a sale to get paid, and the bigger the sale is, the more they get paid. So you literally are going to them and saying, I will pay you more the more you empty my wallet, start emptying my wallet, and I'll just keep giving you more the more that you can talk me into it, right? You're paying them to take advantage of you. And of course, they're going to because nothing, you could never say words that will override your action of giving them more money for doing a certain thing. That incentivization isn't just a financial incentive. It informs them of your desires. Even if you, you know, you just, I'm going to take you to court. You screwed me over. No, 
They did what your wallet told them you wanted them to do, right? I work in business. I could never make an argument that they took advantage of you because you, using your contract with them, said, I will reward you the more you get me to pay. So their job is to empty your wallet and it is you who gave them that assignment. Now, why do you feel you should do that? If you're coming from the US and Canada, we have this legal framework that says that while you incentivize them in one way, they're required to act in a different way because of the law. And if they don't, there's a law with teeth that will punish them potentially severely. And so they don't behave that way because your incentivization is not caused by you. It is a pre-gone conclusion and it is a monopoly. So they have a bunch of controls over them and they have to act in your interest in very specific ways. That is unique to the US and Canada and there's laws that make that happen. In places that don't have those laws, which is most places, the concept of using an agent like that is absolutely crazy. It makes no sense. You're not paying them to do what you think you're paying them to do. It is, there's no framework for them to do that. They don't have, in the US and Canada, they have access to things like the MLS, and that's where their value primarily comes from. Here, they don't have an MLS. Those values that they have in the US and Canada don't exist here. And so they're just the same as anyone else. You could ask any random person, hey, I wanna go look at houses. Okay, let's go look at houses, right? Let's look around and see what's available. Yeah, these are people who say it's their job. Maybe they pay more attention to what's available, but they don't have any special access. They don't have any special rights. They don't have any special training necessarily. They're just people who are saying they want to be involved in real estate. And that's fine and that's great. But for you to go out and choose a person who's in that position and then tell them, here's how much money I have. Here's what I'm interested in. Here's ways that I'll reward you for, for misleading me more. How could they possibly resist selling you the biggest Hail Mary possible and doing anything in their power to convince you it's a good idea because you've made it clear that's how you'll reward them? Of course, that's going to happen. So that, it, it just doesn't make sense. You need to work with a lawyer. Your lawyer is in a different boat. They're not rewarded based on the amount of the sale. They don't get paid extra by convincing you to make a bigger sale. They don't get engaged until you're already making a purchase. I'm sorry, a purchase, not a sale. And uh, so all those things, they don't have those same incentives to take advantage of you. Their only incentive is to make sure you don't get screwed because then you'll recommend them to someone else, right? So they work for you. The way that you engage an agent guarantees they work against you. Right? And, and it's you doing it, not them. Right? Same thing. I work in, in IT. I do a lot of business consulting. And I constantly talk to businesses and say, you just went to a salesperson and put them in a position that the only way they would get paid is if they screwed you over. You gave them no way to do a good job by the way you were, in, the way you were imagining. They were only going to get paid if they took advantage of you, of course they did. That's their job. They have to put food on the table. What do you really expect them to do? Okay, so we've covered what not to do. We've covered what to do. And hopefully all this comes into a picture. Most importantly, if there's one really big takeaway, it's probably to have patience. The thing that happens is that people become impatient. It becomes so exciting. I can move to paradise and you forget that you don't need to buy a house to move to paradise. You really have almost no benefit to doing that. Um, and I know some people are gonna say, well, I could buy a house and then I could put it on Airbnb and that'd be fantastic. Well, be aware, right? One, Airbnb is not a big thing here. You could make some money for sure. It is a thing here. It's just not a big thing here. Um, there are basically unlimited places on Airbnb, Airbnb already. If you look and don't see a lot, it's mostly because people have taken them off the market because mostly they're losing money and they don't want to bother operating them anymore. When you have a place on Airbnb, you have to have someone that manages that for you while they're gone. It is unfortunately really common for the exact same reasons that all the other things have been said for people who do that to end up in a position where they have the same people who are looking to take advantage of them for real estate will also look to take advantage of them to manage those properties. And we have known cases where people have had houses stolen from them, where they have had houses destroyed. They have very little legal, legal recourse because they didn't go through lawyers. They didn't, you know, they, they were thinking this would be easy and they'll just let someone else handle it. And there'd be all this framework to protect them. And there isn't, you're on your own. You need to go to a lawyer and do things, uh, manage your own business and, and hire good people and make good selections. 
That's hard. It's not magic. You can't just come in and snap your fingers and have everything happen. So, and that's unfortunate. That's just a, a challenge in any market like this. But uh, if you're looking at it as a potential business, well, we're just going to Airbnb it while we're not there. Be aware that that could cause a lot of additional cost. You may have a lot of damage. You may be very sorry you went that path. More likely, you won't be sorry you went that path, but it may not have the benefits that you're expecting. You may get lucky. It may do great, right? We know people who have done well, but the people that we know who've done well with Airbnb also run it as a business and never use it as a house, right? They're, they're very cautiously designing everything to be a business, uh, and they, are, they end up being houses you wouldn't want to live in because what's good as an Airbnb may seem nice as a house, but isn't as good as you might think. It's just the nature of things, right? So um, in order to have a place become a really good, effective Airbnb, you might end up being very sorry, right? Your furniture gets destroyed. Um, you, you have to buy cheaper things than you would want to have be in your own house, whatever. Uh, but the, the incredible cost of needing to maintain uh, cleaning services and caretaking services and, and all that because you bought a house uh, may be extreme and you easily, this is important, right? Renting here is so cheap uh, and buying is also cheap, but there's so many things to go wrong if you buy a house and you don't live in it yourself full time that uh, the ability to rent a very nice place for potentially just a few hundred dollars a month and you could rent six months at a time. So if you're looking at something as a vacation home, uh, you may be looking at, well, if you just took $3,000 a year, you might be able to rent something and have absolutely no worries. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, maintaining the house. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen when you're not there. You're not, not going to have to worry about picking the wrong location. You don't have to worry about uh, the, how the beach changes over time. Ah, it changes, move on to another beach. You have the flexibility to stay or go because you're just renting. Right? That's really powerful for most people, unless you're an active real estate investor. Um, unless you're planning on making money on the market somehow or you want to pass things on, buying may not make a lot of sense, even though this is a great time to buy. The rental market is so low and remains long term so low that you could rent and have the flexibility to move around, to come and go, to do whatever you need at minimal expense. And when you really start thinking about that, you could do amazing rentals for three or maybe $4,000 a year. And that's to have a rental for half the year, right? And uh, uh, you don't have to worry about maintaining a house. You don't have to worry about buying a house. You don't have to worry about spending a year shopping for a house. Suddenly you just get to enjoy having a place anytime you want it. And if you really want to make that work, consider a storage unit or something like that. Buy a small bodega, something really cheap. Uh, rent a tiny place that you just rent all the time, right? And store stuff there so you can move furniture in and out wherever you want to go and be able to do anything you want to do. There's Think outside the box. Don't approach Nicaragua like an impatient North American. Think of it as a patient Central American. And suddenly you could be looking at a fraction of the cost you were imagining at many times the benefit um, and, and not find that ownership or being in the place that you thought is really all that important. It's amazing how much flexibility and, and power there can be in looking at it in a different direction. And uh, that's, I think, a really important takeaway is that the average person that we see looking to buy would have benefited so much from renting. It would save them so much uh, headache and so much money. They would be so far ahead and then someday if they want to buy, they're financially in better shape to do so with way more knowledge. Uh, and and that's, that's, I think, the thing that people need to look at the most. The desire to buy before you've come here itself should be something you should really evaluate carefully. What, what would possibly make you want to buy when you have not lived here previously? Um, as someone who, I mean, I always want to, you know, I would love to own something in every country. Like, I get the emotional reaction, trust me. Um, but... To really look at tying up my financial resources anywhere is a really big deal because that always comes at a cost of loss opportunities. And if I buy in Nicaragua, I can't then turn around and say, well, I want to buy in Guatemala. I, I spent my money there. I can't go to Spain. I can't go to, oh, and now I can't rent because I, I have to use this and I'm all tied up. Using the rental system, using more flexibility, not letting the emotions um, of needing to buy drive your decision making may give you just way more power. Get down below, ask your questions. This is a really long one and a very different format, but this was a, this really hit me just how much people are watching my show and others and not getting this, this package of, of how the market works. And, and, and like we, we put out so many warnings about every one of these things, um, but, but people are still just routinely 
coming completely blind with, I'm going to do everything that we've warned against. And every person that, that writes to me, I, I tell you, it's like every single person. They are all making the same mistakes. They're watching the show and still making exactly all the things that we warn about every time, right? Oh, we talked to this set of people. We did this bad thing. We exposed this thing. We're at this risk. We, we got confused about this thing. We were told all these things and we believed all these things that logically don't make sense, that if we look around, don't make sense, observationally don't make sense, and yet there's such a pressure to believe it, it's hard to, to really realize how many people are willing to really take advantage of you, and that's important. And, and really importantly, the people you need to worry about here the most, right? And everyone I know says the same thing. The predators in this country are not jaguars in the, in the jungle. It is not the poverty-stricken people in the, in, the, in the poor barrios. It is the expats who come here and take advantage of other foreigners. That is, your, that is who you need to be most wary of. And of course, I fall into that category. Be wary of any gringo who is trying to sell you something, is trying to lead you somewhere, is trying to... That doesn't mean they're all bad. But you need to be really, the moment you see someone who's not a Nicaraguan and they're here selling services to foreigners, stop and really think, why would this person be looking out for me? If you find a construction worker and they're not Nicaraguan, they're probably breaking the law. They're taking a job from Nicaraguan. If so, like all these things really stop and be like, wait, something's wrong. This isn't how it would work. If you were going to America, Right. If you're going to Canada and you wanted to buy real estate, would you talk to a Canadian who lives in that place? Or would you talk to a foreigner who doesn't have the right to work there in most cases, who is making their money through an international transfer and has no legal oversight and you have no legal recourse if something bad happens? Would you ever do that? Absolutely not. If you were in Toronto and you wanted to buy an apartment and some Nicaraguan came up to you on the street and was like, hey, I sell, I sell property. I, I'm Nicaraguan. I live in Nicaragua and you'll have to pay me in Nicaragua. And then the deal will happen in Nicaragua. You're going to red flags. You're going to go off like crazy. Whoa, this is probably not legal. They probably have, you know, all kinds of, there's a, something going on. They're going to be able to take my property and I won't have any recourse because I can't sue them outside the country. Like all kinds of crazy things would run through your mind. And they, you'd be right in many cases if that happened. But in reverse, if a Canadian is in Nicaragua or an American is in Nicaragua and they're trying to sell you property in Nicaragua, but they aren't Nicaraguan or, you know, in some cases maybe they are, but they, you know, they're, they, they, they don't get to be citizens, right? Not normally. You're, you're a resident. You're just resident here. You have to work through a foreign business. And so their money has to move out of the country and back in, in most cases, um, you really probably have no protections whatsoever. This will be seen by a court as two foreigners having a dispute out of country. The fact that you were talking about a property supposedly in Nicaragua, probably irrelevant. That you thought you were making a Nicaraguan deal, probably irrelevant. You didn't have Nicaraguan lawyers, Nicaraguan citizens, Nicaraguan businesses making the deal. The chances that they're going to say, oh, it's our problem, it's pretty darn low you're gonna be left very much on your own. So evaluate those things in that way. And so I, I really hope that this video helps fill in gaps. So go watch other videos that I have. I've covered a lot of this, but it's hard to put it all together. It's hard to internalize that it, it is a completely different place and you need to be patient. And, you, and I know this dream of buying from remote and just magically showing up and owning a piece of paradise feels so good. It is so tempting. Do not give in to that temptation. It is not going to end great for you. And I know there are tons of people who have done this and will tell you they got a good deal. Every time someone tells me that, there's there's like a couple people who say it, and but then there's something that that you have to really evaluate. Like, oh, actually, well, they're married to a Nicaraguan. They had Nicaraguan resources. They were not left on their own. Okay, so it worked out for them. Or someone tells you, I got a good deal. This happened... To, Almost every time we say this, someone posts, and like, I didn't get screwed over, but they never give you the details to actually evaluate that. If you think about the average person, if you get screwed over, chances are either you never figure it out or not for a long time because whatever made you fall for the deal in the first place means you didn't evaluate carefully. You may never evaluate. And of those who do evaluate and figure out that they got screwed over, do you really want to admit it? It's an emotionally devastating thing to admit that you've really screwed up and lost your life savings or got totally taken advantage of in what should be a predictable way. 
you don't want to admit it. In some cases, people will come out and claim the opposite. And I work in business. I said this a number of times all the time. It is a standard thing in IT that people who have been completely screwed over, absolutely torn apart by a, a quote unquote IT consultant who was not in any way looking out for them, did things that easily qualifies professional negligence, should be criminal, absolutely screwed them over. They will go and tell other companies that they got treated great because they're either completely unable to evaluate the most simple business dealings or they are so ashamed that they actively want to promote what they did to try to cover their shame. Both cases are really bad. You need to be really careful getting advice from people who you have not evaluated if they got a good deal. No matter what they tell you, you don't know if they got a good deal. And trust me, if you come to me and say, Scott, did you get a good deal on your properties? You did all this research. You did all these things you're saying. Did you get a good deal? I can tell you with quite a high degree of confidence, at best, I got a mediocre deal, right? And that's only a fair degree of confidence. I am sure I didn't get a great deal. You can probably trust me on that. But did I get a mediocre deal? I feel like I did, but I might not have. Do I have any way to truly evaluate if I got screwed over on my deals? No, I do not. And if I could, would my emotions make it difficult for me to admit that I got a bad deal? Absolutely. I would irrationally try to find any way to justify why the deal I got was good. Well, my position on the beach is better than someone else's. Ah, the property's better known. I got a little bit more space or my view is better. Whatever. I'll rationalize those things. That's a really bad reaction to have, but we all do it. So you can't even trust for me to tell you that I got a good deal. And I, I can tell you I got a way better deal than almost anyone that you talk to. That's how far removed we are from knowing when you get a good deal. So you can't come to any of us and say, what does a good deal look like? I can only tell you this is how good of a deal I got. There may be, it's possible I could have gotten the place for half as much, right? I don't know. And no one knows, right? Someone, the person who sold it to me knows whether they would have potentially sold it for half as much, but that's it. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Get down below. Ask your questions. If anyone's still watching, thank you. Leave a little, a little uh, something in the in the notes that you you made it this far because this is this is crazy far in the video. This is one of the longest ones I've ever done, but it's just so much. I feel that people need to sit down and watch this, and and just get some of this. Everything's cheaper. Relax. There's no need to panic. Be patient. Enjoy. Come experience paradise. It is a wonderful place to live. Tell your friends. Share on social media post this place. Seriously, this is good information. Put it all over the place. Let people know how they need to behave when they're looking at property. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And if you do want to hire us for any kind of consulting, which could just be tours, it could be just some time on the phone talking one-on-one, -on -one, info at relocatenicaragua.com. Shoot me an email. We'd love to discuss how we can help you with any aspect of relocating, renting, buying property, whatever. We're not real estate agents. We don't sell anything. We don't represent any properties, but we can help guide you, find your resources, get you a lawyer, whatever. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.